It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We are excited today. Landon and I are excited today to have Mike Derryberry with Compass Cleaning Solutions in the studio. We don't always have guests in the studio this time of uh we're in this time of COVID-19, so sometimes uh, we're doing it via Zoom, sometimes in person, but uh, we appreciate being in person. I think it gives us a little bit different feel. Landon, as uh, as usual, I shouldn't say as always, is uh, is coming to us from Las Vegas. So Landon, how are things in Vegas today? All good here today. I think uh, I think we're going to hit a high of like uh, 65 or 68, so no, no complaints out here. Well, wow, much much cooler there than uh, than here. I think we're actually supposed to get up to ninety today, so it's been warming back up a little bit here. So it doesn't bother me, honestly. Ninety degrees is is still pretty cool weather. I'm wearing jeans instead of shorts, but uh, you know everything's good here. <laughs> so, well, before we uh, before we started the show, we were talking to Mike, uh, Landon, and I, and Mike. We're all talking a little bit about our our love for uh, rock and roll or music in general, and and. Uh, it would be awesome to to talk the whole hour about rock and roll. I think we would have a, a great conversation. Uh, we didn't actually get to this in the conversation before we started, but Led Zeppelin is my favorite is my favorite band, um, and so Mike and I have that in common. I know Landon likes Led Zeppelin as well, and we were talking about Landon's wife Tia and her love for rock and roll. So you know, we literally could talk about it the entire hour. ZZ Top was my first concert. I was by far the youngest person there. Um, but we had a we had a fantastic job or f- fantastic time doing that, and it's it's my dream actually to be a singer in a in a classic rock band. So I think that would be that would be awesome, even if it's just on the weekends uh, at at local bars and so forth here in, in the area. Because yeah, obviously I don't have the I don't have the chops to go further than that, or maybe I'd be doing that now instead of uh, instead of what we're doing here. So. Mike, we're excited to have you in um, Compass Cleaning Solutions. It's a janitorial company mainly commercial or maybe 100% commercial? Yeah, 100%. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that we like to do with our guests before we jump into the business side of things is, is really just kind of have a, have you give us a little bit of your background. Tell us about your family. Tell us about any kids or grandkids or anything that you've got going there. And then kind of give us a little bit of a of a biography of, of how you got to where you are today with Compass Cleaning Solutions, if you're all right with that. Sure. So I uh, have been married for 44 years and uh, been with her for 46. We have uh, two daughters, um, both grown and out of the house, and one has uh, two grandkids. So I'm happy about that. Got yeah. To, got to watch him play some football this weekend, and so that was cool. Basically, the way we got to where we are, it was kind of a weird route. Went to school at Washington State, got a degree in political science and a second degree in business, didn't use the political science degree at all. Basically, I worked in manufacturing for about 30 years. And my wife actually worked in marketing and banking in the financial industry for about the same period of time. Um, in uh, 99, we moved down to, to Southern California for my wife to take on a position as a partner in a software company down in San Diego. Um, I went with her, uh, figured, you know, she'd been moving around for me for years and years. I Time for me to kind of return the favor. And uh, ended up working for a software company myself. Uh, but it was a software company that was dedicated to manufacturing, uh, casework manufacturing. And uh, I was uniquely qualified because I could speak cabinet maker. I could speak, you know, their language, manufacturing and the such. But I also, I'm, uh, you know, this is going to be open discussion here. I am a self-confessed geek. I love computers. I like technology. So it was a great fit for me because I could, you know, kind of do both worlds, right? <clears throat> and we did really well with that, except that in a 
2003, both of us came to a realization that technology was taking me out of my my job, my my position, my my career. Uh, it was kind of working me completely out, and she'd kind of hit that proverbial glass ceiling, right? Yeah. And so we're looking to do something. You know, what what can we do together? And so we looked at a number of different franchises. Um, but none of them really kind of fit our criteria. And one of the things that I learned from my dad, who was an entrepreneur himself, so I say it's in my DNA, right? Sure. Uh, he always taught me, you know, the best business to be in is something that cannot be exported, that is recurring, uh, that, you know, is contract-based, right? That is a necessity and is somewhat, you know, recession-proof, right? And so we started looking around and, we realized that commercial janitorial was one of those things that met all the criteria. But the other thing that we saw about the way we went into this, rather than just being a franchise ourselves, was to be a franchisor or a sub-franchisor initially. And that was because we could really help other people have small businesses as well. And for us, small business has always been kind of part, of, like I said, part of my DNA. It's I've, I, I believe strongly in small businesses. And, you know, I'd had two previous businesses before that. And so, um, you know, it it just kind of fit for us. It met the criteria, the business aspect of being able to help other people start their businesses was a a huge deal for us. And so for us to go in and begin to have a franchise and to then help other people start their businesses and coach them along and help them with their businesses just seemed like a, a very cool deal. Uh, What we discovered, unfortunately, was the company we were dealing with, there were some integrity issues, as we'll probably talk about later. Values are a big deal to me, and ethics are a big deal to me. You know, I just felt like there were some things that were not being done right. Without going into a lot of detail, and I probably shouldn't anyway, we basically separated and 2009 and 2010, January of 2010, we literally became on our own. And uh, since then, we've been able to run the business exactly the way we wanted to run it and with the ethics and the integrity that we felt like was required. And, uh, you know, we've grown and, you know, we've done pretty darn well, you yeah. know, over the last 16 years or so. So, yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> those types of stories I think are awesome, especially having a dad that, that's an entrepreneur and it kind of gives you these these lessons that you learn. And it's, I've heard some of the same lessons, some of them from business school, some of them from my dad, some of them from, you know, other people that I know along the way. And, you know, for, for Landon and I, I mean, we, we have this whole radio program called Tycoons of Small Biz for that very reason, right? We're, we believe strongly in the small businesses yeah. in our country, right? It's 90% of the business. Yeah. Plus. Right? Yeah. Plus. Yeah. And, and so it, it's, you know, you've got these big businesses, Facebook. I mean, I heard some of this stuff on the radio today with the hearings and so forth. And, you know, so these big companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Walmart, you know, you, you, you go through the whole list. Everybody talks about those. But the reality is our economy runs on these small businesses, right? And And one of the messages that we believe in strongly in getting out is the fact that a lot of kids today that are getting ready to go to college or trade schools or whatever they choose to do, they feel like it's got to be something exciting. It's got to be Facebook related or it's got to be software. Or it's got to be technology or it's got to be, you know, this or that. But the reality is, you know, Landon and I both both operate financial planning companies specifically for small business owners and the wealthiest business owners that we have run these types of businesses. Yep. Right. It's the businesses that are needed, like you said, potentially recession proof or at least more immune to recessions than than other types of businesses. But it doesn't have to be something sexy, so to speak. Right. Right. You know, because janitorial services, I mean, by your own admission is is kind of mundane. It's potentially a, a commodity, you know, type of a business. And so, you know, we love seeing entrepreneurs come in that are thriving in those types of businesses, creating jobs, providing a good living for their family, building an enterprise that they can eventually sell. You know, all those sorts of things are, are what's exciting about business. And it doesn't have it doesn't have to be something, you know, a brand new technology or something like that. So that, that's exciting to, to have you in and, and talk about that. So 
tell us specifically, I mean, with it being a commodity type of a business, what sets you guys apart from the others that do commercial cleaning? I, th- <laughs> I get asked this a lot um, because everybody looks at it and they go, yeah, so, you know, it's a, it's a cleaning business. Everybody can do it, right? Well, not really. There are a lot of people who are doing it or, or who are attempting to do it. But I think it really boils down to one word, and it's culture. And a lot of people, um, you know, they, they focus on what they can do, but they have no concept or they haven't really given any thought to why are you doing this? And if you're looking to recruit people, like we're, we're a franchisor. So we're looking to recruit other, fr- other people wanting to start their own business. People want to associate and be involved with something that's greater than themselves. So there's, there's all kinds of studies out there that show that people are more interested in feeling valued and in being involved in something that is, you know, it, it has a purpose and that is worthwhile and, and, and a cause, right? And if you're just out there grinding it out, the money's only going to last you. So after a while, it's like, I'm done. I need to go find something else. And so for us, culture is a big deal. And I started, you know, this whole idea of, of culture, really thinking about this probably over a decade ago. You know, it was, it was like probably 2008, something like that. Um, I started really thinking about what is our culture? What, what do we really stand for? Who are we really? So I, I started really building the concepts and really been started thinking about it. And in 2013, I, I went to a conference. The conference, they were talking, it was a software conference, but they were talking about business. And the keynote speakers were talking about business and they started saying, they were started talking about culture. And I tell people all the time, up until that moment in, the, in that conference, it was like I had this thousand piece puzzle. And I had a few pieces put together in a clumps, you know, but I had no edge pieces. I'd, I couldn't really figure out how it all fit together. And, and really, I didn't have a picture to know where I was supposed to be going. And so it was frustrating because I knew that there was more to it. And I had all these loose pieces and I didn't know where they fit and nothing seemed to work. And I went to this conference and these guys stood up there. And in about an hour and a half, I had this epiphanal moment where I could actually saw those pieces finally come together and it really, you know, really set the stage for the next 12 years. What they basically said in there is a little equation is what they, they used. And, and basically they said, culture is purpose plus values plus a mission. Now, I've added vision and mission together as one because I believe Mission is more the tactical side of exactly how you're going to do things or not what, I mean, what you're going to do. As, and the vision is that emotional picture of what that's going to look like, right? But before you even get to the mission, you've got to have a purpose. You've got to have a why, which, you know, Simon Sinek talks about, you know, the concentric circles, right? He goes, everybody yeah. knows what, few can tell you how, and very few can tell you why, right? And if you cannot define why you do what you do, then you're just going to be a commodity, right? And so, you know, you asked the question, what makes us different? I think it's because we have really defined our purpose and our cause, not only for us corporately, but for our customers as well. So for example, for us, our corporate purpose is to raise the standard of clean by empowering entrepreneurship. And so the idea behind that is from from our standpoint is we felt like there needs to be a higher standard. We need to keep pushing the envelope going higher and higher with greater and greater excellence, doing the best you can. Now, we're not perfect. Okay. So so please don't misunderstand. You know, we screw up just like everybody else. Okay. But the objective is excellence. In fact, one of our core values, if you skip to the values, is excellence is not optional. Now, I didn't say perfection. I said excellence, focusing on giving your absolute best in every situation, right? That's excellence. And so we, that's what we preach in our, inside the four walls of our, of our business, right? Is that 
that's our, that's our focus. And we're going to raise the standard and we're going to do it by creating this network of small businesses called franchises. But from the standpoint of the, the customer, that doesn't, they look at that and go, oh, that's great. Yeah, nice. Thanks. But what, what they're interested in is the bottom line. So from, from the standpoint of our customers, we say to them, our purpose, our role between our franchise owners and us is to help every single business increase their productivity, their profitability, and their performance. And we do that by creating clean, healthy, safe, and organized environments. Think about it. You walk into an office or you walk into a business of any kind. It's messy. It's dirty. It's disorganized. It's dark. It's, it's all cluttered, whatever. There is just an emotional downer that you feel when you walk in. On the other hand, you walk into a business that is sharp and it's clean. And, you know, it, it, there's bright in it and everything is in its place. And it, there's a whole different vibe. And there are document, there, there are strategic documents. There are s- statistics out there that show that when you go in and you perform at a certain level and you help those businesses have that kind of an environment, their bottom line is directly impacted. So what we're doing for our customers is we're not, we're not an expense. We're going in there and we're creating a positive bottom line. We're increasing their bottom line. Well, that resonates with, with a business. Sure. They say, oh, that's what you're doing? Okay. So then we move to our values and then we say, okay, the purpose is, is why we're doing. So how are we going to do that? Well, our values are what drive how we're going to do that. We talk about our values all the time. I mean, it's, it's a topic of conversation on a fairly regular basis. It's because if we're inconsistent with our values, then we've got a lack of integrity, right? I mean, there's, a, there's an integrity issue here, right? And one of our first, first values is we have integrity. We do the right thing, right? We, we have ethics. We do what we say we will do. If, if we can't even get those two right, then the rest of them really don't mean anything, right? right. And so the whole thing about understanding what makes us different, it really comes down to our perp- having a purpose and living that purpose, promoting that purpose, having values, living those values every single day. And then, of course, we have mission or we have visions that, that are short-term, right? They're going to be maybe five years or a 10-year, whatever it might be. And then, you know, you've taken that mountain and you've you got that hill and you planted the flag. And, okay, it's time to move on to the next one, right? Those are constantly moving and changing. But those other two, I mean, they're, they're eternal, man. They don't, they don't change. And so for us, and you can probably see I get animated about this because it's, it's, it's really what makes us different. It's not that there, there are a lot of companies out there who can clean. There are a lot of companies out there who can get in there and vacuum your, your, you know, your office, right? Yep. Dust and whatever. Okay. But that's not you know, ultimately that's not sustainable. And that's why a lot of their employees basically take shortcuts and they get, and you get people complaining. And unfortunately that's kind of part of the industry, you know, but, but that's again, why our purpose is to raise that standard, to make it better, make it different. Yeah. Well, I know how Landon's mind works. So he's probably got like 10 other questions (laughs) now from what you just went through. (laughs) So I'm going to give Landon a chance to weigh in here on, on uh, what you just said. Yeah. So, uh, he, he knows me quite well, huh, Mike? Um, so you, you know, Mike, we're, we're only 20 minutes into this conversation and I can already just tell you that, uh, this, this is, this is awesome. Um, I, I love what you've already said. Can't wait to see what you're going to be saying here in the next few minutes, but this conversation might end up going in a totally unplanned direction. And I, I hope that you're okay with that. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, the, the times that we're living in right now, I think it's so relevant that we're having this conversation with you. Obviously, we are all experiencing the challenges that uh, are presented to us by, by COVID. I would venture out on a limb here and, and make an assumption that your business has probably done just fine through all of this. In fact, it's probably thrived 
So I've got a couple of follow-up questions. One is, you know, talk to us a little bit about how COVID has changed your business. And also, I would be curious to know if you also are coming across a lot more franchisee opportunities as people are getting laid off from their current you know, jobs and looking for opportunities. Um, so maybe just let's, let's start there for a second. Okay. So the, the, the franchise thing has been interesting because it, it, it's a little bit of a challenge because it kind of relates to the first question a little bit. So you would think, and I did too, that, you know, on February 15th, you know, we were kind of at the bottom of everybody's priority list. And by March 15th, we were the essential business, right? And I said that from the very beginning. But as we've gone through the, the months, the reality has kind of hit me. And that is, we service businesses. When businesses shutter, we have no business, right? So that's been a bit of a struggle. And typically, that's the bread and butter for any franchise that we bring on is, is, the, is the monthly recurring. Now, mm-hmm. we've seen increases. We've added businesses throughout this entire period, not anywhere near at the pace that we had previous to this. But, but you know, we've been adding some businesses here and there. Where we really saw an, a jump and a huge increase were the businesses who actually continue to operate because they were considered to be essential businesses, but then would have outbreaks, right? So they would have positive cases. So they'd have to shut down for a day. We go in and do what we call a deep clean, a COVID um, disinfection. If you want some, some point, I can explain all that, but it's probably boring to most people. But the point is we would go in and we would actually clean the place. Uh, So we had like an emergency kind of setup and we had a crew that basically all they were doing was like, I mean, at one point, we were doing like five a day. I mean, it was crazy how many we were doing of these kind of jobs. So it balanced out, right? I mean, it the actual revenue, if you want to look at it that way, kind of just went static. You know, it was just kind mm-hmm. of level, right? Maybe a little bit up. You know, we're still in the black, but I mean, it, was, it, wasn't, a huge, it wasn't a huge number, right? What is, so that has impacted our ability to bring on franchise owners because— mm-hmm our guarantee to them is that we're going to provide them with business, right? Well, if I can't provide them with business because COVID is preventing businesses from being open, you know, it creates a cycle, right? It creates this this scenario where, yeah, we want to bring people on, but at the same time, you know, we don't really have the businesses to give to them, right? I mean, because our team goes out and um, they pay us a commission to go out and and get business for them, right? Which is fine. I mean, we'll, we, we have no problem with that. But if there's no business to give to them, then they have no business to operate. Then it's hard for them to justify buying a franchise if they're not going to get business. Because we tell people, you know, our average, we fulfill our obligations. And this is all the way across the board. From, let's say we guarantee them 2000 a month to uh, $10,000. Take that range. Our average is about 69 days. So they're basically up and running at full capacity within 60, 90 on average. Now, some of them are a little bit longer, some of them a little shorter for a variety of reasons. But the average is 69 days. Well, when COVID hit, and now we're talking like seven months, you know, because there's nothing there, right? So what we've done is we've had to pivot. And it's pretty interesting. Um, the way it's impacting us is kind of kind of interesting because at the end of last year, and the end of 2019, as we started strategic planning for, for 2020, it kind of rolled over a little bit into the first week in January. But we had this, this plan that by June of this year, we were going to roll out a whole nother um, division or a whole nother offering for our customers, which was going to be a disinfection service that included um, a product that we that we know of, it's a it's called an antimicrobial barrier, and what that barrier basically does is, after you've cleaned and you lay this barrier down, it continues to kill viruses, it continues to kill bacteria, mold, fungus, whatever it might be, so that when we're not there, it's still killing, it's still 
protecting whoever's in that bu- building, right? So we thought, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to get this going. <laughs> well, that timeline got moved up um, about four months. <laughs> it's just got, it's just, by the end of February, we went, uh, you yeah, know, okay, it's time to, to ramp that one up a little bit. So we had to really change our whole philosophy and pivot quickly this year because the environment just dictated that that's what we had to do. I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure if I completely answered it or not. No. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I pre and appreciate the, the honest, uh, you know, thoughts and, and feedback there. You know, uh, I, I'd like to kind of continue down this pathway just, just for a minute here. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated by the franchise uh, model. So talk to us, you know, for, for a minute, you know, because I think I can speak for Austin and and I that I think we're in agreement here that uh, you know Austin and I serve a, a variety of of business owners. Most of the business owners that we serve are more mature businesses, probably like like yours. But we also have some you know clients that are you know in their first you know three to five years of business and they're really ramping up and growing their businesses. But the reason that I am a huge proponent of the franchise model is because the reality is, you know, a a high, high, high majority of businesses that start are not around in five years. You know, they, they just don't survive. And in my personal opinion, it is because they do not have a model to successfully run and operate a business which is exactly what a franchise provides, exactly. right? Talk to us, and I, I know that we, 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 could, we could spend probably two hours talking about this, Mike, but maybe in, in three, to, three to five minutes, maybe talk to us about when somebody approaches you and says, hey, I'm, I'm interested in, in coming on board and being one of your franchisees. Just talk to us about what, what does that process look like and what, what is your promise to them? What are you going to deliver to sure. them as your franchisee? So the, first of all, all this is governed by the FTC because you have to have a franchise disclosure document and you have to, you know, li- write everything out. So I'm not going to tell you anything here that's not already written out in the in the documents, right? So basically a person would come in, we would um, have an interview with them. You know, basically they, they there's a little short, application, if you want to call it an application. But we would have um, what we call a, uh, a disclosure. And that disclosure basically is my um, franchise development manager we would basically sit down with them and explain to them how our system works. Now, the, the guts of that is, the, the real ne- nucleus of that is, that unlike a lot of franchises which are territorial-based, we, because we're a service and we service in so many different areas all across the valley, uh, our focus is more on having an individual tell us what what their income level desires are, okay? So we have like nine, 10 different programs that we simply tell them, if you want Let's say we'll just use the, the bottom one. Let's say two thousand dollars. I want to I want to be billing two thousand dollars a month in in business. Okay. So we tell them that within 120 days. Keep in mind, I told you we did it in 69 for all, right? But within 120 days, we are going to provide you. We're going to offer to you a certain amount of business. And I say offer for a reason. I can't control whether they accept it or they reject it. I can't control whether they just completely blow it off and 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 lose it. I, I can't control any of that. But what I can control is how much I'm going to offer to them. And that business comes to them without, it comes as part of an initial package. So they pay for a franchise and they can finance it through us or or through a, a, vet, a third-party vendor that we have that, that provides loans and stuff. Either way, they're they're bu- they're buying a, a a business, but part of that purchase of that business is that we're guaranteeing them a certain amount of business within a specific period of time. 
once they come in and we start offering them, uh, they come in, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to have a training session with them. It's a two-day training, and they spend that with our um, our customer service reps who are guys that are out in the field, who are in touch with the customers. They, they themselves know how to do the business. They've got lots of experience. Both of these guys have lots of experience. And they sit down with them and go through all the different aspects of a business, of how we want them to, to operate. We, we talk to them about what products we're going to use, because the products we use, the product and the the procedures and the tools and the and all of that are are not things that they normally would see in a Home Depot or or someplace, right? All of that stuff comes directly to us, uh, and so we we explain to them how it gets worked and how this this process works. Then they will go out and actually work with them on the first their first account. So they get a first account, and these guys will actually on that first night. Maybe, maybe it'll be the first week. They'll go out with them, working with them, helping them understand the process and the flow. Typically, we don't try to give them a really big account right off the bat because, you know, if you've never done it before, you walk in and you see a, you know, 50,000 square foot building and you're going, holy crap, <laughs> you know, you know you're gonna, what am I supposed to do with this, right? And they're typically not uh, staffed for that. And so we take them into these small accounts and we help them work through that and build a process, build a system so that they understand how it works. Once they understand it on a small to medium-sized business that there are account that they're working on, they can then just take that and multiply that as many times as they want. I'll give you an example. One of our, one of our franchise owners came to us, gosh, I don't remember how many years ago now. It's been a long time. It's probably been seven, eight, nine years, something like that. She came to us we don't even offer the program anymore, but at the time we were tr- we were making an attempt to get some inf- get people to see what we were doing, and so we put out this nine ninety nine, and you can get a five hundred dollar a month you know account, right? So she came in, and for the first few months, that she immediately got five hundred a month in billing. It was like I think one or two accounts or something, and she was just doing these little small accounts. And then she came to us one day, and she says, "You know, can I get some more accounts?" Well, sure. We didn't know that you wanted more. You know, you, sure. So we gave her another account. And she did great. So we gave her another one and another one and another one. Today, she's billing somewhere in the neighborhood of $36,000 a month. She's employing, like, I want to say half a dozen members of her family, her sisters and cousins and, you know, whatever, as well as some friends and some other. She's got like, I don't know, three or four crews going on. She's a superstar, but we spent time with her and we worked with her and we helped her get to that point. And now she's doing the same thing with all these other franchise owners. So that's another thing that we do is we kind of try to pair them up with a successful franchise owner so that they, they'll tell them, uh, yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, that. That won't work. You know, that's going to be a bad thing. You want to do this or you want to do that. And so in a sense, that's kind of what we do as we go through. I don't know if that really was the kind of depth of answer that you wanted or if you wanted more, but I can see. No, that was great. No, that was, that was awesome, man. And we, uh, we want to keep uh, extracting uh, this uh, great uh, information from you, but um, I think uh, we're going to take uh, about uh, 30 to 60 seconds here, Mike, and uh, uh, hear from one of our sponsors and then uh, we'll let uh, Austin pick it back up here. So just hang with us, please. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. Welcome back, Tycoons. We're here with Mike Derryberry with Compass Cleaning Solutions here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And we've been talking about the franchise model. And, and Mike, uh, I'm not even sure Landon knows this, but I, I have owned a franchise in the past. And I'm certainly not an expert in franchises, but the reality is what you're explaining is still different than most franchises that I've, that I've been aware of and I seen. I agree. Right? Um, Landon's 100% correct. The franchise system is great because it gives these franchisees 
an operations manual and a model to follow that will lead to success because it's been done and proven by others and already replicated in most instances, right? But I don't believe that I've ever heard of a franchise system that guarantees a certain level of revenue to their franchisees. That's intriguing to me. And and the whole system, the way that it's not set up geographically based, but, you know, what do you want in terms of revenue? And so it, does the price vary based on what they want right. in revenue? Give us a little bit more. Yeah. So there. if let's say that they want $2,000 a month in billable business, that would be run price. And it incrementally goes up. And we have like three tiers. And within each one of those tiers, there are like three different programs, right? But as it goes up, there's obviously more expense because obviously we're doing more work. We have to do it faster. You know, I mean, there's, there's just a lot more that goes on to it. If they buy a bigger program, it's, it saves them some money long run because if they, let's say, started with a program and then basically went through and, and paid commission for the other 8,000 as opposed to buying a 10,000 program, I mean, they're going to save about, about 20, 25%, right? Yeah. Somewhere, I can't remember the exact number, but it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a significant amount of, of money that they're going to save. If they come in with cash, they can also save a lot of money. They're about 25% by, by coming in with cash. So the idea is we know that there are people that are going to be like this franchise owners that are going to get to that point. They're going to be like killing it, right? Yeah. But maybe they can't do it right away. And maybe they're financially strapped or whatever it is. And so, you know, we typically work with individuals to help them get started. You know, I wanted to go back to something that, that Landon was saying a while ago, and, I, and I, I think it kind of gets to this point, and that is when we're talking about, you know, small businesses, you mentioned the fact that, you know, in, in five years, you know, like 96% of all businesses are out of business, right? I mean, it's that's tragic to me. Yeah, <laughs> That's just criminal <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But if you look at franchising, actually 94% succeed in five years or are continuing to be successful in, in you know, five years. Well, why is that? It's what I call the speed bump syndrome. I used to live in Southern California and you'd see these guys with these little rice rockets or the little, you know, the, the Japanese cars that are dropped about two inches off the ground. <laughs> the most hilarious thing I ever saw was these guys trying to go over speed bumps because they couldn't get over them, right? Because they couldn't get their cars up high. They get stuck on this speed bump. They have to go around or the back, I mean, that was, was the funniest thing I've ever seen. But in business, that's not funny because what happens is a business will get to a certain point. They're growing and they're growing and they're growing and they get to a certain point and they get stuck because here's what they get stuck at. I can't afford to go forward, but I can't, acquit, I can't afford to quit. I'm stuck. Yep. So they just sit right here at that spot and they can't go any farther, right? Well, we recognize that that's, that's a problem for almost every small business. Now, unless they've got some funding or something, you know, that's, that's great, but most don't, right? And so I understood early on that if we could do something to help them get over that speed bump, they could be, they have a better shot at being successful. So what we do, we not only, you know, guarantee, but the, we, we do a lot of the back-end stuff that most people are, you know, when they start in business, don't know how to do. You know, my, my favorite example are doctors and attorneys. They're great attorneys. They're great doctors. They are crappy business people because they've never been taught how to be, how to, how to do business. Yep. And that's not their fault. Nobody ever taught them, right? Well, the fact is that most small business people start because they're really good at X, Y, Z. Or they feel they're really confident about doing whatever it is. But as you guys know, there is so much more to the back end of a business that those are the things that kill you. Those are the things that put you out of business. Yep. And so we made a decision early on, if we were to do the back end part of the business or provide the service for them, that because we had skilled people that are very good at doing those kinds of things, like the accounting and the billing and all that kind of stuff, we can apply Economies, economies of, scale. of scale. Thank you. So it, we, we can provide economies of scale for all of our franchise owners. So we have one or two people that are doing all this stuff for 90 to 100 different franchise owners. They pay us all a little bit of money. Now, that speed bump just became flat. 
now they don't have to worry about it anymore. They can keep on going. They can run the front end. They can deal with the customers. They can deal with their scheduling. They can deal with their employees. They can, they can do all the front end stuff that they understand how to do, right? Mm-hmm. But that back end stuff that kills the business, we're handling that for them. Yeah. And so we, we just found that this, this is the way it, that, that schedule, that, that process seems to work the best. So early on and maybe forever, I mean, you tell me, you guys are actually going out there and bringing the accounts on for these franchisees. Correct. Is that forever? Is that if they want it to be, they'll con- you'll, you'll continue to accept commissions or they start to build no, on their the, own? Or they there's can a do basic a commission. Yeah, there's a basic commission and they can, there's a couple of different variety of different ways they can pay for those. But, um, you know, one is is they buy a block of business, which is basically commissions paid over a period of time, or they can do it within a year and they just pay us a commission and we we deduct it from their check for one year or whatever, and then they're done with the commissions. As far as keeping the account, look, we've got we've got accounts that we've had um, franchise owners that have had accounts for twelve or thirteen years. I was just looking at our LTV report, our lifetime value report, um, just this week or last week. I mean, we've got a bunch of accounts we've had for 10, 11, 12, 13 years. And in several cases, we've had the same franchise owner doing the same account for that length of time. So they can have it as long as they want. Now, at the same time, if things go sideways or things happen or whatever, then we have the ability then to take that account and transfer it to someone else until we can get some things corrected with that franchise owner so that they can then start up again and get going again. You know, we're never going to say to somebody, you're, you're done. And I mean, they pretty much have to, you know, they, they really have to do something catastrophic <laughs> for us to say you're done. <laughs> so it's um, like a professor with tenure is what you're telling me. Kind of. You really have to really mess, mess up, up to lose Yeah, your exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and we we do our best to work with, with our franchise owners. Uh, sometimes, you know, life changes and things happen in, in franchise owners. And we've had franchise owners leave for a variety of different reasons. You know, that it's kind of the circumstances or they made made that decision. I mean, there have been a few situations where we've we've just had to say, look, this is not working and you need to move on. Um, but that's so rare. I mean, it, it happens so rarely. Yeah. I mean, it sounds to me like this... Honestly, it's a unique way of setting up a franchise system. It, it obviously works for you. You know, I, I think about how many people, and Landon kind of alluded to this earlier with, you know, the fact that so many people have been furloughed or laid off or lost their jobs completely with this. And, and he kind of thought that maybe that would, you know, spur this this growth of your franchise system. And I and the reality is there are lots of people out there that are in that situation. There are also lots of people who are still employed but aren't really happy in their mm-hmm. job, right? Mm-hmm. Lots of people who are making forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, uh, but it's just a job they don't enjoy. They don't. They're not excited to get up and do it, and they they want to work for themselves, but they're just not sure how to cross that threshold. And it seems to me like you've kind of built this bridge over the threshold for for those people in that situation specifically to say, well, I never thought of myself as as one who would operate, you know, commercial janitorial services, but man, there's some freedom there. And, you know, Mike's team will help me build it. And, you know, I can employ some people and I control my own destiny and I don't have to work for this person. You know, I mean, imagine having to work for Landon for Well, yeah, loud, I mean, you know? that would be horrible. Like, yeah. <laughs> having to work for somebody else. <laughs> you know, there are lots of people out there, right? I mean, I, I did a I did another podcast last week for somebody else where I was the the guest and, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs start that way, right? They start because they're either unable to or unwilling to work for somebody else. There are lots of people out there. So what's your message to somebody in that situation as to why they should be considering Compass Cleaning for, for their opportunity? Well, I think for w- one thing, I mean, I, w- I was thinking as you were talking about the different kinds of people, people who are working right now, we, we have found the best franchise owners are ones who are working for other people currently. They have that entrepreneurial spirit. They tried to do some things at their current work and got shut down. And they just feel like they're in this trap, right? They're stuck at this job. They've had some experience. Uh, 
you know, perhaps they've got people that work for them. Perhaps they've got people who, um, you know, they've, they've managed. Well, great. Those are the kind of people I want to talk to because you have the skill sets, you have the drive. And if, if you look at it, if they come in and say, you know, what I do when I do this is to help businesses become other businesses, be successful and to improve their bottom line. That's what I do. What I do is important. And again, that's why I was saying earlier is raising the standard. So many people don't believe that what we do is all that valuable. And I, and I, I'm trying to change that message. No, it's financially valuable to you. Yeah. You will make more money if we are allowed to do the things that we can do well. And when they, and if a person comes in and can buy into that vision, you know, there's Maria. She's doing thirty six grand a month, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, it's, you're you're kind of preaching to the choir a little bit for me because I'm I'm somebody who loves cleanliness and order. That's yeah. just. You know, and, and Landon will chuckle a little bit because he's climbed into my car before and there's been trash everywhere. So <laughs> the, the, the reality is that it doesn't always work that way because I'll, I'll get tied up in between appointments and, all, and stuff just gets thrown on the floor, right? And so then I'll clean it up. But one of the biggest pet peeves that I have is dishes in the sink or dishes on a countertop, or dishes in my daughter's, my 17-year-old daughter's bedroom, right? That kind of stuff drives me nuts. And I and I try to tell this story all the time that if you would just empty the dishwasher every day, like I asked you to, then I can load the, I'm happy to load the dishwasher, I'll load it, and then it's clean. Because for me, I feel better in a room that's clean, yeah, right? And organized. And, and in business, I know that I'm going to be more efficient and I'm going to get more done in an area that's clean and set up appropriately for me to be efficient in what I'm trying to do. You know, if somebody's listening and they don't believe you or I that that, that, that really does, just they can send me an email. I will send them a, a, a graphic that will go through, I mean, all the studies that have been done and all the research that has been done. And they'll go, okay, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, it will make me about six to eight percent bottom line. Okay. Yeah. See, and I thought you were going to say you'd be happy to come over and dump a pile of trash on their desk and see how they feel 24 hours later and what they got accomplished. But well, we only do that at night. So, yeah, so. <laughs> I think you could even take it a step further in in you know a, a real life experience or example. You know, however you want to look at it. You know, this morning, Mike, I was, um, I was in Einstein's, uh, the brothers, bagel. you know, getting a, getting a bagel this morning because, uh, I had to shoot out of my house, uh, quickly. And so I, I walk in and, you know, I, you know, got my mask on and I'm standing there and they're a couple of minutes behind. So I go use the restroom for a moment and I, I walk in, right. And immediately I'm looking around going, what the heck? When is the last time this restroom was clean? This is disgusting. Get me my food and get me the heck out of here. Cause this is, this is, mm-hmm. this is, this is gross. Exactly. So I think if anybody wants to experience that themselves, go into a restaurant, a restaurant and find one that has a dirty restroom. And then, yeah, you know, let's see how that translates over to, uh, you know, uh, the, the success of a particular location. Well, what's worse is it's seven o'clock in the morning. It's like, you know, you think, well, they should have been here last night, right? I mean, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we're, we're, we're pushing up against time here, Mike. We, we want to make sure we, uh, problem. you get a couple more minutes talking a little bit more about uh, some thoughts that maybe you have and, and maybe kind of what, what you got planned for the future. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about you know, your business and your industry and where, where do you see things going here in the next, you know, five to 10 years? You know, it's pretty interesting. I mean, you look on TV these days and there's these commercials for iRobot and the Roomba and, you know, all these kinds of things, right? And uh, the technology, I think, is going to ultimately touch every industry, including ours. Now, I don't think C3PO is going to be out there, you know, dusting your (laughs) shelves anytime soon. But when it comes to floor work and some other things, you know, 
We've already, I mean, have you been to Costco or Sam's Club recently? They got robotic floor machines walking around that entire building all day long. Nobody's sitting on them. They're just running around the building, yep. right? So that part of the industry is changing rapidly. They actually have buildings uh, in, in various different parts of the world, including back east in a number of different places where they have self-cleaning restrooms. So what it ends up being is all the fixtures and all the walls and all the material finished materials are waterproof. And so what they'll do is at, at some point, alarm goes off, you got to get out, you get out, they lock the door, it automatically locks the door, and the system inside of that bathroom goes in and literally sanitizes that entire restroom with high pressure water and whatever and vacuums and it sucks all the water up and 15 minutes later they open it back up and it's nice and pristine and clean okay well that's something we normally do you know so that would be something would be taking out out of our our hands so i think technology is going to to be a, a key player one of the things that we use right now is uh communication technology in our industry for the longest time log books paper log books have been like the thing right I've never understood that whole concept because papers get lost, binders get lost, people forget to write things down, whatever. So we have a system where we have QR codes that a person can literally take their phone, click on it, and it opens up a, uh, a, a basically a, a little survey and basically says, what area do you have a problem in? And you can s select and choose what the area is. What, do you, what needs to be done? And do you have a comment? Boom, boom, boom. And it gets shot to us and our program pops up and we say, okay, we've got that report. We know what to do and our people immediately go take care of it. And our field reps and our office staff on operations all get that information at the same time. So that's technology, right? That's using technology to be more responsive, to be more um, in tune with what's going on in our customer customers' um, buildings, right? So I think things like in technology and that sort of thing, I think are going to definitely become you know, kind of the, in the future is going to be a thing. I think for us, one of the technologies that I'm pretty excited about right now, as I alluded to it earlier, was the antimicrobial coating. I don't understand why this isn't something that isn't being done literally in every single building across the nation. There is a product that's been around for the, the technology, the, the, the chemistry has been around for a long, long time. And basically, if, if you can coat, let's, let's take um, a restaurant. Well, when do we go in there? At night, right? After they're closed. But what happens in between when we're there? Well, there are people that are cleaning. Now, I'll be honest with you. I love the, the restaurant industry. We do a lot of restaurants. They're one of our best industries. I love them. But honestly, they haven't been trained on... These people have... The, the bus boys and the people have not really been trained on how and what to use uh, in an effective way, right? Well, if we were to do what I'm suggesting, going in and, and basically doing this antimicrobial coating, which, by the way, has been proven to last anywhere from 30 to 90 days before you have to recoat, like a floor finish. Yeah. They can go in and do their basic cleaning. And, okay, maybe it's not perfect. Maybe it's not what we do. But the patron who walks in is not going to get sick from putting their hands down on something and picking up a, a virus or picking up bacteria or some kind of fungus or something, right? They're not going to get that. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a safe environment. Think about daycares. Think about a doctor's offices, hospitality, any hotel. I mean, you just, just go on and on and on. Anytime when there's a lot of public traffic, mm -hmm. this is a technology that's there that I think is unfortunately not being used. And I mean, we've got the ability to, to do it. I've got a whole stack of this stuff sitting in my office right now waiting to be applied. You know? So, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, you kind of led, led to it earlier when you, you used the word pivot earlier, right? right? So you guys had to pivot to getting this antimicrobial stuff out quicker than you had planned on. And the future is going to require you again, right? I mean, any small business has to be ready to pivot as technology changes exactly. or needs change or governmental regulations or whatever it is, you've got to be willing and able to pivot in order to stay in business. Correct. That's one of the biggest things that make small business owners tycoons in our in our estimation is that they're really able and willing to pivot when necessary. Yeah, well, much faster than an IBM or a GM or a, you know, even a Google. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
they're so big, they have so many policies, they have so many moving pieces that it's just not that easy to make that kind of a, a switch. Whereas a small business, they you know, have a meeting, make a change, right? Yeah. It's not often in a small business that you hear the phrase, well, we don't do it that way, right? I yeah. mean, you hear that all the time in large businesses, small businesses, it's, okay, well, we haven't typically done it that way, but man, maybe we should look at doing it that way. That that might be more efficient or that might be, you know, lead to more to the bottom line or whatever it is. Small business owners are typically more open-minded about those yep. those sorts of changes. Exactly. Well, we're, we're real close to the end, but I did want to give you an opportunity to just mention your book real quickly yep. and make sure that we have an opportunity to know what it is that uh, that you wrote about and why. And, and then we'll have you close by telling us how to get, how our listeners can get a hold sure. of you. Sure. Uh, well, so the book is kind of an interesting thing. It really, I didn't really set out to tr- write a book. It was about three, four years ago. I started uh, with the, I, my wife and I had been talking and, and we'd just been kind of mulling over all of the lessons that we had learned over the last 16 years or at that point, 12 years. And, you know, what did we learn? And, you know, I mean, I don't want to forget that lesson. That was such a good lesson. And so I thought, it, well, what I'm going to start doing is I'm just going to create a, a, a digital file and just write down all the lessons I've learned, maybe a couple of sentences, you know, that that will help me remember, you know, what that situation was. Um, as I went along, um, one of the things that I, I uh, began to uh, develop was little axioms, right? I, I read this book called Axioms, and it was like whole idea of you, you create an axiom, the axiom helps you remember the whole thing. Like one of my core values is burn the ships, right? And there's a whole story behind burn the ships yeah. and, and this kind of thing. And some people know the story, some people don't, but it's just complete buy-in. I mean, there's only one. It's option A. That's it. You yep. don't have an option B. We're going for it. We're all in, right? Well, so I started thinking, well, what are some of the axioms that, that I could put onto some of these things? And so as I would add these ideas and as I was at, add these, these lessons learned, I, I started adding these axioms to them. As I started, ha- because I was doing that, be- I started having conversations with our small business owners. They kept saying, gee, that was a great, that was a great thought. Appreciate you sharing that. You really ought to write a book. And normally my, my response was, thank you. I'm not an author, but I appreciate it. Thanks. But, you know, at the end of 2018, I started to get, there were a lot of people saying this on a regular basis, which kind of surprised me. Well, I happened to have a friend who was a publisher, a book publisher. And I said, okay, look what better person to tell me the truth? Because the publisher is not <laughs> going to put his name on something that's not going to go, right? They don't want to have that reputation of, yeah, we, we publish bad books, right? That's not going to fly. <laughs> so I figure, okay, so I'm going to go talk to Jeremy and I'm going to say, hey, listen, buddy, tell me if this has any, any legs to it. And so I sent him over my, my raw list. Just here's, here's, my, here's the stuff I've been doing and here's what I'm thinking. He writes me back in a couple of days and says, dude, this has legs. You need to do something with this. So one of the lessons I've been learning had been learning at that time and still applying today is it's the axiom is, you know, pursue every opportunity until it isn't. I said, okay, well, this looks like an opportunity. I'm going to pursue it until it isn't. Well, the more I pursued it, the farther it went, it got farther and farther and farther. And we started ramping up and we started doing this thing. Nine months later, I got this book. It was kind of the idea, the idea of writing the book was mostly to um, capture some of the more salient and more significant truths that I had learned personally. Now, they may not necessarily be, you know, the, the biggest truths for everybody, but they were for me. Um, and they were truths that I had learned from a lot of different people and from personal experience. And so I just basically added the add them together and we put them together and it's got this little book. And awesome. It is. It's called Hard Knocks, right? Hard Knocks, a real world education in business and personal growth. Awesome. Well, I, w- I would assume we can get that on Amazon, other yep. places. Go to Amazon. Great. You can do that. And what's the best way for our listeners to get a hold of you? Uh, you can either, uh, well, typically I don't do a lot of Twitter, um, so probably, that's probably not a great one, but LinkedIn, <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, you can go to my, either my compass site or my personal site. Uh, the other way would be just send me an email. It's at m. Dairyberry, and it's D like in Dallas, E R R Y, B like in boy, E R R Y, at compassphoenix.com. It's all spelled out. Um, but those would be the best two ways to get a hold of me. I, I, I'm not a real social media, you know, I got people who do that, but I don't really, I don't do social media. <laughs> so, Understood. Yeah. 
Well, Mike, we've really appreciated the conversation. We appreciate you taking the this time to be fun. here. And uh, we have learned some great uh, things here. And, uh, and we look forward to watching your progress as time goes on. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for being here. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite 